The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, a place where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And uh, I'm excited for Tyson uh, Yonkaporta to be returning to the Stoa. Uh, he wrote a, a delightful article on LinkedIn called Slow Down, Calm Down, Scale Down, and Step Down. Um, and then I and reached out to him immediately after I read it, and uh, he agreed to come on. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the MC for today. Uh, we got a new um, MC with us, Campbell Dixon. Uh, Campbell is a new meta modern superstar um, on the block. Um, he reached out to me on letters, says, Peter, please be my mentor. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And then uh, um, and we're here. So uh, I'm going to take in Tyson. He's going to introduce um, or, uh, Campbell, I should say. He's going to introduce Tyson and then uh, introduce the uh, protocols for today. So, Campbell, you're up. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, really good to be here. Um, thank you so much, Tyson, for uh, joining us. So, um, just want to start the call by kind of taking a cue from your article and just slowing down, taking a breath. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. So welcome, Tyson. I just wanted to uh, ask if you wanted to kind of frame your your article and your location. Looks like you may be sitting on the ground somewhere in nature, which seems fitting. And then we can open it up for questions. You can post your questions in the chat. Um, and if you don't want to be public, go ahead and uh, just write your questions, indicate, and I'll read them. So uh, welcome, Tyson. Uh, hey, how you doing? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm in Benella right now. It's a little town um, in uh, Victoria. We're just passing through. Awesome. Yeah. What brings and, you there? Yeah. Um, in-laws. I got to visit the in-laws. Nice. But um, yeah, so just like to pay respects to the um, the traditional uh, custodians and owners and elders and everybody of this place here. Um, it's it's quite a significant. It's it's a no good town. It's got lots of bad luck because there was you know a pretty bad massacre here um, back in the day a few decades ago, and um, it's just still got a bad feeling. So you see a lot of people just going crazy here, and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, doing all the things that poor people do in, in small towns. <laughs> uh, but you get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where I'm at. Um, okay. And, you know, pay respects to everybody else, wherever you, wherever you are, where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. There's always just thousands of people behind you and uh, linking out to you as well. So that's where we are. Absolutely. Thank you, Tyson. We're here. Thank you. Great. And uh, do you want to sort of describe a little bit about maybe what's coming to mind for you um, surrounding the topic, which is your LinkedIn article, maybe give <laughs> background on that? Well, just, I mean, the first context would be LinkedIn articles in general. <laughs> That's where you put your half-assed stuff that you would never put anywhere else. You know, LinkedIn, it's like, it's not really an article, is it? It's just, you know, when you have a, a brain fart. And I put a brain fart there and it made a lot of people laugh, I guess, um, which is good because then you can find out, you know, uh, who among all the, the integral theory people um, have a sense of humor. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because it's kind yeah. of, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like I was being fairly respectful of Ken Wilber and everything in there. And I don't know, I don't know enough about integral theory to really, you know, make a good commentary or critique of it. Um, yeah, but I kind of, I was in a playful mood and I was trying to get to the bottom of, you know, the spiral and all the colors and everything. And, and so I, I did what I normally do and go and sit somewhere with good groundwater and just try and connect, um, you know, with the land, with mother, everything, and just, um, you know, start, a bit of a dialogue and see what uh what she thinks about it all <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know you just kind of let you it's 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 rigorous you know you let your mind sort of be pushed here and there and see where it flows and, and then you wait for little signs and things to come in to let you know that that thought's worth pursuing and then you just keep pursuing it 
But on this particular day, I just, <laughs> I don't know if spirit was um, just feeling playful or cheeky or what, but it, it just kept, it was just funny. Like there were just all these jokes coming out. Like, I don't know, like this silly idea. I know it's not true, but it was kind of just a joke that I had of um, <laughs> this idea that like we're the children of Mother Earth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's just this idea that she's like, um, like Mars is her is her ex partner, and, <laughs> and but she's got custody of us, and like Elon Musk is like, fuck it, I'm going to go and stay with Dad, <laughs> and she's like, don't go and stay with him, he's getting all uppity, oh, he's all uptown now, with his fancy new blue bitch, Venus, whatever her name, <laughs> like I, there was just all this um like stupid stuff coming through, um. But I just kind of felt, I don't know, I got that feeling, that message from country that, um, yeah, it's time to have a play with things and, and just have a bit of fun. And there are all these birds coming around and they're doing silly dances and stuff around me while it was happening. And another one dropped a feather when it came over and it just sort of played in the wind and all that kind of thing. So I just played with the ideas for a bit and, and you know, they were too stupid to put anywhere else. So I put them on LinkedIn, you know. <laughs> so I was messing around with the, um, you know, clean up, wake up, grow up, show up, messing up around with those ideas. And then just, uh, I don't know, my attention get, kept getting drawn down, 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 like everything was coming down. And so I, I was thinking about that grow up, show up, and I'm thinking, well, what's with all these ups? <laughs> Let's go with some downs. So I ended up with a corresponding, um, what was it? Um, um, slow down calm down, scale down and step down as, as being a good starting point. And, you know, lots of funny thoughts about, you know, like clean your room. And I'm like, going, who's that for? How many people in the world have their own room? I've never had my own room. <laughs> who are these people who have their own room to clean? <laughs> anyway, it was just, um, it's just making me laugh that like half the world's population sort of has to clean everyone else's room. <laughs> Probably sick of cleaning. So they've nailed that first step. Anyway, so it was just, it was just playful and, um, and it made me laugh. So mm. I, I'm happy to talk through it, what I can remember of it. And um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we can go through. Just, yeah, we can look at the think, downs, or we can open it up for questions too. If you're ready to start getting some collective yeah, well, yarns going, we could going. just we could just drop into them as we go along because it's just kind of fun and funny, and um, and we should probably just have a bit of a laugh. Great, perfect. God, everything's so serious lately. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm ready to have some fun, play around. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I want to see like who's who's like doing integral theory, like like it's karate belts or something, you know, like they're leveling up. You know, I'm green now. <laughs> Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Hey. yeah. 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 There's a piece about <clears throat> hierarchy, and I I have some questions about that too. Maybe yeah. I'll ask and get the get the conversation churning too. I was curious yeah. about you t in your book too. You critique hierarchies and and placing yourself above other people, and I was just wondering um, what happens when you place other people above yourself. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> I think, I think that's an act of narcissism as well. Because hmm. who the hell are you to decide that somebody's better than you? Um, <laughs> you know, like you're qualified. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So most of the time I, I, I don't, um, I don't sort of fangirl over, you know, people if I meet like, uh, you know, famous people and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. you know, most of them, most of them know better than me anyway. Um, but every now and then, every now and then I might a little bit like, you know, we always slip, we all slip up mm. every mm -hmm. now and then I get excited about somebody, but then you got to pull it back in and go, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think about that? Oh, it's tough because I mean, in this community, I'm pretty much fangirling out all the time, uh, especially now I'm just talking to you right now. Uh, <laughs> Peter introduced me, so it's hard to contain that. Well, let's let's feeling. see if we can uh, keep cure you of that today. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah, I'm just... excited. 
a really, really very unspecial person. <laughs> yeah, well, you certainly helped me get into right relationship or, or aim me in that direction, I suppose, with a lot of things. So. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, yeah, and one of those things is just I'm I'm actually in Idlewild in Southern California, which is a uh, uh, Kauia land. That's the the indigenous peoples that lived here. Um, so you know, I'm trying to kind of see it as a um, a place with that history, you know, that you talk about, and and see how I can relate to that. So, mm. Yeah. <clears throat> I just saw a question pop up. Yeah, let's get into it like a belt a belt system for someone to become an elder <laughs> you know um it's funny sometimes it, it seems kind of arbitrary but um in a lot of places it's it's basically you know every 15 years you you're going through a uh, bigger and bigger ceremony you know um and and if you're ready then you you go you get initiated into you know the very very deeper knowledge um a lot of you know and as you as you progress right through into elderhood you started to move into the more uh really esoteric celestial um sort of stuff going on etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i guess there are belts for a lot of different um there's a lot of different cultures in australia so like anything you say is true for one group maybe but not true for another <laughs> so um but yeah a lot of groups have dance belts um my mom doesn't but a lot of groups have ceremonial belts, you know, uh, women's ones and men's ones. But um, I guess the belt is just the belt and you don't get like an extra little shell on there for your second Dan elderhood or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but, um, but often, I mean, so you've got elders, you've also got knowledge keepers. So you might, you might have like a 22 year old, you know, man who's, um, who's inherited a lot of totemic stuff like his father might have been the one that was that um spoke 15 languages and and kept all of the songs for all the surrounding groups you know and was the song maker and 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 you know big law man and he might pass away and pass all that on to his his uh son and um so that son would inherit that like you know i've seen quite young men as uh senior law men you know so it's not always about like you don't just um become an elder when you reach a certain age and weight you know you <laughs> you um and you can't just like show up and and that's it um yeah you gotta you gotta do uh, some extra <laughs> extra stuff to get there yeah mm. nice yeah. Thank you. um uh, oh who's who's ending the stoa next march <laughs> Peter, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> yeah, we're, that question we're... just came up. Is that an example of stepping down? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was, starting the store was stepping up, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Like, uh, so when I'm saying step down, I don't mean everybody stepped down. I just mean like the old the septuagenarians who are running the world and refuse to give it up you know they're, they're in all of the positions um of authority and they're the ones who have deteriorating memory like just biologically they you know their memory is deteriorating all the time and they're not elders they're just old you know so i guess when i'm talking about step down i'm, I'm talking about those ones all those teenagers in 80 year old bodies who um, hold all of the, you know, the, the positions of authority and power uh, and usually don't have those on merit. They just keep stuffing it up and stuffing it up and stuffing it up and they just get to hold that positional authority and sort of run all our institutions and our meaning and our cultures and our communities into the ground, you know. Um, I don't know. Just read up on ancient Rome and see how that went for them. It didn't go very well. Ah, oh, scaling. Do I see anything worth scaling? <clears throat> so that was one of the ideas, one of the downs that came to me was scaling down. Um, and scaling down is really um, <laughs> just about, I mean, what they call degrowth. 
or you know regenerative um, um, economies, etc. Um, basically, everything's about scale now because it has to match the, the infinite growth models of um, of a, an economy, a global economy running on a self-terminating algorithm, and um, and we've got to be done with that. Um, so yeah, the message I got there was scale down. Yeah. So, you know, minimalist, I guess. But if uh, we, don't, we don't really need all this stuff, we certainly don't need to keep growing it. Mm. Mm. Makes me want to ask what stuff we do need. And as I asked that, this picture of you with a, a piece of wood and an ax comes up on my screen. Oh, wow. Okay, that's because my phone just dropped out. Here we go. I'm back. <laughs> um, yeah, what do we, well, well, okay, well, there's the answer that Jim Rutt gave me. And he, he was just talking to me about my carving. And he was talking about, uh, I was talking about the indigenous idea of increase rather than growth. Um, you know, an increase is about increasing the uh, relations and the quality of relations uh, within the system, uh, rather than trying to grow the size of the system itself. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, quality rather than quantity and you know, connectedness within the system because there are so many infinite combinatorials there just waiting to be discovered. Um, you don't need to grow the size of the system, just the, the connections within it, within the one you have. And um, so he was talking about the carving and he said like, well, you know, would it be better to make, you know, 400 sort of uh, shitty boomerangs or <laughs> just, um, just make one really good one? And, and be getting really intricate, you know, carving, you know, a lot of really rich detail into that. Uh, so he was talking about that in terms of scaling into the micro rather than scaling into the macro. And um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's the way we could scale is, um, is into the micro. <laughs> so increase the complexity of the system rather than the size of the system, I guess, yeah. Thanks. Hmm. You see this. Uh, I've got a question from Tim here. Um, he says, "I'm curious how we can work with the positive energy that comes with the desire to be active in our communities and participate in improving them, but avoid what seems like an increasing number of change makers who maybe don't quite understand how their involvement might colonize others' futures." Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's your the danger of your gurus, isn't it? Which is why we've got to make sure we never fangirl over anybody. Um, you got to get, yeah, we've got to get rid of the guru. Maybe that's why Peter's talking about ending the stoa. Maybe he's like, this has been really good and it's doing really well. But, you know, as soon as something has a name and it's, and it's doing well, it usually becomes corrupted. So it's best just to, um, jump it and walk away and start something else. Um, you know, I guess entropy follows if you if you become static with something and it sort of stagnates if you if you sit on it you know you might have something that's great and you sort of keep going with it but then all of a sudden then you have to keep tinkering it and tinkering it so that it doesn't die and then you usually end up with power struggles and all kinds of stuff going on and like of course your gurus and and you gotta you you know it was it ken wilber that said kill the buddha if you meet him on the road like he referred to that in his work. I think that was him. Definitely kill the Buddha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ken mentions that for sure. And I have a question here about um, integral uh, conceptualizes hierarchy is um, from Kylie, um, a question from Kylie in the chat. That's yeah, mistaking map for the territory. You see that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, look, it's, um, I, I think, you know, people who are into hierarchies or who just don't know other way of, op don't know any other way of operating, they'll always bend things like good systems around into a hierarchy. And like, you know, Wilbur's quite deliberately made that into a spiral, you know, for a reason. And um, that everything that you achieve from, from your starting point, you take with you. And you have to have it with you or, or you're not, 
you know, you can't get through the next bit. I can see what he's trying to do. He's trying to unify um, things together, um, you know, so that everybody can carry a common story, even if they have different parts of that story. And that so we'd all be able to, um, you know, speak from the same story and, um, and make sense together, even if we're speaking from different parts of the spiral that we recognize the entirety of the spiral as, um, as you know, the entirety of all our possibilities together. Um, yeah, but still, like I said, when I talk to people that it's, it's like karate belts and, and they, they're like, you know, do the secret handshake or something. And yeah, yeah, I oh, integral theory. Yeah, well, what color are you up to? I'm up to this color, uh, you know. Um, yeah, but um, I don't know if see if it's starting at the center of things at pre at a pre modern what we're calling a pre modern level. I, I don't think there's very many people who have mastered that yet. You know, and I don't know if it's a model where you have no progression without mastery, or whether you can pick up bits and pieces from right across the entire system um, at any stage. Which maybe it would have to be like that. I mean, is it a vertical curriculum, you know, like maths? Do you have to learn this and this before you can get to integers? Or can you just jump in and learn a bit about integers and a bit about Erastathini's sieve and a bit about, and then, then go back to your times tables or whatever. Uh, but um, yeah, I certainly can't progress. So I, I still haven't mastered the, the first stage yet. I, mean, I might need to live a few more times before I, before I nail that postmodern, uh, pre-modern. <laughs> um, I didn't see any other questions. Oh, we got a question them. here from Rachel in the chat. Uh, how do you reconcile <clears throat> with doing work that is important to you and your circle personally that is often thankless on a wider scale? Mm. Well, it depends what you're after. I mean, if you're after thanks or some kind of reciprocity and that that's a precondition of you doing anything, then pretty much most of your life's going to be thankless. And you're going to have to like hang around looking at a whole heap of people who are getting thanked left, right and center for doing stuff all while you're doing all the heavy lifting and getting nothing. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's what most of the world has to do. Um, yeah, so how do I reconcile? I don't know, I just don't think about it, I guess. Uh, there's just the work and if I've got enough to live, then I've got enough to live, that's good. But I'm pretty good, I'm on a pretty good income at the moment, uh, better than it's ever been in my life. Um, and I guess if I was a, a, a person just in the world, you know, an individual in the world, I'd, I'd be doing really well but I'm not, I'm part of an extended family. So, <laughs> you know, I don't get to keep that money. That just, that just goes out. Like, you know, every few days, there's <laughs> somebody needs something, you know, um, you know, people run out of food or people get stranded in Weeper or, you know, um, there's airfares, there's, there's always a funeral. So, you know, like, I, I wish I lived in that world of like four weddings and a funeral, but, but we don't have that, you know, we have like a hundred funeral, hundred funerals and a wedding. <laughs> That's how it goes. So, um, but anyway, I've got my niece's wedding coming up, so I'll be paying for that, and you know, and uh, and all the rest. And um, yeah, and anytime anybody runs out of nappies and food, as well. So you know, you if you're in an extended family, if you get more money, there's kind of a sharing economy going on, and so you know that's always going out. Um, so I don't know, there's just no, I don't know, you don't have that idea of wanting to be uh, thanked. Um, there's no word for thank you in, in my home language, if that makes any sense. Because you just do things for each other, like that's just what you do. That's the minimum standard, I guess that's showing up. Did I see another question pop up there? Yeah, you got one in here from uh, Kuelti in the chat. Um, 
they're curious if you could riff on incentives um, and incentivize when it comes to cultural shifts. Oh, yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Um, well, look, I mean, I guess incentives are fun. I guess if people aren't living in the pattern of their being and in, of their relationships, then they probably need incentives. And I mean, as we all, like we, we all know the, we've all listened to Daniel Schmachtenberger a thousand times, you know, we know about the systems of perverse incentives, et cetera, that um, we're currently laboring under. Um, you know, so we know about the perverse incentives and we know about all the theories and, um, you know, Civium, like uh, Jordan Hall stuff, the, yeah, like uh, setting up different systems of incentives, setting up tech and blockchain so that we don't have to worry about having to trust anybody and all that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, that's good. I suppose that that's all some good training wheels to start getting people back to sort of relatedness. But at some stage, you know, you got to teach that toddler to ride the bike properly and they got to fall off a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I guess if you're living your true patterns of, of what you are, you know, just biologically, the way we're patterned as human beings is, um, is, is, is just to live in those distributed ways, distributed cooperative, you know, sort of demand sharing cultures, um, you know, in your nice little Dunbars, <laughs> as it were, everything transparent. It's sort of the way we're patterned to be. And whenever you see the controls of state, uh, state marketplace removed temporarily, if there's, you know, a, a huge calamity or a tornado or a, a flood or a fire or something, you know, people just slip back into that pattern. Like we've all got it in the same way that a whale raised in captivity knows where to go when you chuck them back in the ocean. They got all those migration routes patterned into them. They know what to do and we know what to do as well. So I'm not too worried about us as a species. I think we'll go feral really fast and, and recover those patterns as soon as the bigger controls are removed. Um, just might take a few decades for this uh, civilization to finally collapse. Hello, I'm curious if I can frame this in a, a little bit of a way. I recognize I'm sort of rapidly talking today, but I think you're touching on it, and I'm wondering if you could really answer it. How can we just quote unquote calm down when we run out of food or money or shelter? Because I often wonder who's not at the table of these yeah. integral conversations due to a lack of access. Yeah, I, I think calm down doesn't mean lose your agency or your your will to act upon the world. Um, yeah, that's the, um, I don't know, that tiny paragraph there, even though it was a joke, um, you know, it was mostly about uh, getting along with each other, um, uh, particularly because I don't know our enmity and who we're fighting and how we're fighting. Uh, it's, 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 we're looking sideways we're all looking sideways for the enemy, you know, for the witch, um, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, we're not looking up, not looking upwards, you know, to see what's, what's actually worth pulling down. Uh, we're kind of just tearing each other down left and right. So I think a lot of the calm down stuff was just, I, I think it's more about just the outrage that's getting in the way of people actually, um, you know, coming together and making sense and understanding where all, what all these problems really are and, and where they're coming from so that we can actually take some kind of action. Um, yeah, I think that's more what the calm down was about. It's not about pacifism or like, like, cause I certainly don't believe in that. <clears throat> it's not about just being all, you know, oh, meditate and be the change you want to see in the world and all that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's not what I had in mind there. Yeah, it's like, it's like calm down in such a way that, you know, if you're in a, um, I don't know, a green movement uh, that's trying to stop fracking on your continent, that's fairly important. So if somebody else in your green movement sort of, I don't know, had their cap on backwards and you thought that was appropriation, I'd like probably just let that go. 
because they're fracking. Over, so maybe, maybe like that guy putting his cap on backwards is not your most important uh, thing <laughs> to attack. I mean, I'm using a really flippant example, but you know, it's um, you know policing each other, you know, culturally, linguistically, all these kinds of things. I mean, it's good to establish norms, but norms don't get established, um, you know, with aggression. Because you, you're breaking the most important group norm there is anyway, in the first place by policing those things aggressively. Um, you know, I think if you're all coming together around fracking, then keep your eye on the prize, keep your eye on the ball, calm down. If you know you don't like the sound of someone's voice or what they're saying, it's just well, you, you're going to have to get along. You know, you don't have to like the people you're working with. You don't even have to agree with them. Nice. Yeah, it looks like we get a question from Joe Lightfoot. Uh, Joe, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, now that your own work is gaining traction, have you thought about how to avoid creating institutions and integral like cultures in your wake? Um, yeah, I, I'm just basically. <clears throat> Uh, most of the, you know, podcasts and any, like I, I don't do any marketing at all. Most of the podcasts I do are kind of um, uh, cheeky and rough stuff like this. That's sort of more about sabotaging my own brand, you know, um, so that I don't come across as somebody who thinks they have an answer or no, I, I don't know anything. You know, I'm just a cheeky boy with some silly ideas and I'm just having fun with it. And um I don't know, sometimes getting cranky about it. And, and that's about it. Um, you know, I, th I think, I don't know. And I, people are probably sick of hearing that from me, but I, I keep asserting it just, you know, and, and I guess that, that could be part of the calm down thing as well. It's like, don't get too excited about anybody. I mean, some people make sense, make really good sense for about a year and then it, it's moved on and then but they have that brand of being someone who's a good sense maker that they're either just talking the same old shit or they've gone on to something else that's a bit dodgy, you know? Um, I mean, everybody doesn't make sense all the time. So you can't have like, you know, a big king dick sense maker running around. Um, that's no good. So I'm starting to come around. Peter's not talking to me about whether he's shutting down the store or not. He's refusing to answer me. But um, I'm starting to come around if he's, <laughs> if he's serious about that. I'm starting to come around with, uh, after my initial, no, not the stoa. I love the stoa. It's like, just take a breath, calm down, let it go, let it go. It's just a step. There's plenty of step. There's plenty of porches to sit on. You don't have to just sit on that one step. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to have to move and go sit somewhere else. That's all right. We're all gonna have to move soon. Alf, got a question, you gotta unmute. Cool, thanks. Always a pleasure, Tyson. Um, I got two questions, but I might sneak them in. <clears throat> For context, I think this is coming from like cows, pigs, and witches. So I don't know how legit that is, but I always remember the story of uh, the tribe who idolized the pigs and they had these ceremonies and eventually they'd go to war and the net takeaway of it, of it partly was is it established a harmony so they didn't overgrow their region so in what looked like total I don't know mythical bullshit of worshipping there was actually a secret pattern and a deeper pattern at play um, yeah. which I found interesting but with that said they're also murdering their neighbors to maintain that pattern so with yeah. that, and there's also a lot of idealizing of indigenous ways of being now. So my modern mind wanting to rank things with my karate belt. So I'm curious, is there a spectrum of indigenous ways of being or some more harmonious, not just with nature, but also with their people? I mean, it's also kind of an art, right? There's maybe not right and wrong, but I just wondering what your take is on that. Um, yeah. Sometimes I feel like it's just luck. <clears throat> Like if you happen to be lucky enough to stay in a place that where the climate's stable enough um, for long enough that you don't have to migrate to a different hemisphere, 
Uh, <laughs> maybe it's just that. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's me being cheeky, cheeky again. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's, there's ruins in Africa that are older than anything, you know, like stone masonry and stuff like that. Like, like pretty much everybody experiments with civilization. It's like, you know, when you're a kid and you, you know, I don't know, try glue sniffing or stuff like that. It's not a good idea. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of kids do it and, and then just sort of some of them figure out, oh, shit, I better stop doing that. Um, I can't remember my middle name. And some of them just die, you know. Um, yeah, I had a friend die from glue sniffing when I was a kid. Um, it sort of happens, you know. And I guess that's what um, civilization is. It's, it's kids sniffing glue. <laughs> That's just being silly now. Um, yeah, but I think everybody experiments with it from time to time. So, I mean, I'm, so, I'm not far from a place uh, now. I could drive for a couple of hours and be in a place where, you know, there was a massive permanent sedentary uh, village. It was too big even to be a village, you know, enough to house thousands of people, not just hundreds, uh, with permanent stone dwellings. And... Um, and stone like masonry lined aquaculture um, where eels were kept and bred. There was uh, eel breeding and then a whole big production line of uh, smoking eels and then trade routes going right out, you know, across the continent, uh, taking this smoked eel out and trading it everywhere. Um, you know, everybody's experimented with civilization at one stage or another. I mean, it, it never lasts. It can only last about a thousand years before you know, um, the law of the land will catch up with you and slap you back into the dirt. Um, I can, and usually people will go, oh, that's right. Yeah, we can't do that. We've got to return to pastoralism or, you know, um, you know foraging and, you know, um, and kind of just more land management, you know, a form of agriculture that's kind of, you know, just maximizing all the food plants and the relations between all those things and setting up really good you know, ecosystems of essentially food forests and, um, and pasture lands um, all over and then just tend those and move through those things seasonally in abundance. Um, you know, everybody returns to that in the end. Your descendants will, but they'll get back to it. Um, everybody forgets from time to time, you know, and suddenly you got some pyramids and then you go, whoops, you know, we better be get back to herding camels again and <laughs> just growing zucchinis or whatever along the Nile. <laughs> Let's just chill and relax. Yeah. And I guess that's part of it, that um, slow down, calm down. It's okay. You don't need that much stuff. It's, it's abundance. You know, the land will work with you and for you. Mm. And um, it will give you everything you need, like absolutely everything you need if you can come into the right balance with it and, you know, bring that into some kind of equilibrium um and there is equilibriums to be had sorry equilibria i think is the plural so the uh if i if i heard that then it's one great experiment some glue sniffing involved um and there's, you know, it's connected to the land uh instead of focusing on the past because i don't see another question i'm gonna just snipe in here um yeah. I saw another article about whitewashing of indigenous knowledge or ways of being. I don't know if you saw that, but just what you were talking about, going back to land, pasture, food forest, totally up my hippie alley. But yeah. do you think there are good ways and better ways that our quote unquote corrupted westernized minds um, can go about, you know, experimenting with our own new kind of I don't want to say meta, meta indigenous, but making it our own, right? Um, yeah. But, but not diluting uh, some of that wisdom. And it'd be pretty arrogant and uh, naive for us to even think we have that wisdom without generations yeah. of the knowledge of the land. So going forward, right? Like, like I'm involved mm. in a future thinkers eco village project, which might likely blow up. But like, mm. what advice would you give for us to try to listen to the land and experiment mm. in healthy ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because you're going to need humility 
uh, to be able to come back into that relation, that right, right relation. And, um, you know, all the other kids are going to tease you for a while. <laughs> I think the other kids are going to tease you, tease you for a while. <laughs> so you can't have that, like, hey. <laughs> and, you know, I guess you just got to take your licks. Um, yeah. It's just going to feel crappy for a while. You, you won't get to feel special. But then after a while, you probably won't want to anymore. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, yep, yep, this is, yep, why to atavism, that's all right. Look, um, there are people struggling with this. I've been talking to a lot of Vikings lately, you know, uh, not Vikings, they're, they're trying to get pre-Viking in their, in their stuff. So there's a lot of Scandinavian people, there's a lot of different groups trying to recover a, um, you know, a, like a pre-Iron Age, um, uh, like, way of being in the world and they've done a lot of really good work to recover a lot of the old knowledge and they've figured out oh there's not four seasons there's seven or eight seasons and you know that so they've got this and you know recovered an old runic calendar and they're, they're figuring out all their skills um you know and they've reconstructed all the bows the old bows and doing the bow hunting and they're figuring out a lot of stuff and really relearning the land and the landscape and it's deadly but um a lot of the fellows I'm talking to, they're like, um, they're really worried about a lot of the people who are doing it the wrong way. See, the fellows I'm talking to, they, they do this, uh, they've recovered uh, practice that the Vikings used to call finfaring. And finfaring uh, happened with, um, you know, when the people ended up being agricultural and then they were smithing steel and all that sort of thing. They kind of lost a lot of the, the, um, the ways of working higher knowledge. And so they used to do fin fairing, which would mean going and staying with indigenous people um, and, and working with their knowledge for a year. Like the smartest people would go and stay with the Same, like reindeer herders. And um, they wouldn't bring back, they wouldn't bring back the Same indigenous knowledge. They wouldn't bring back the knowledge or the story. That wasn't what they were after. They were taking their own highest knowledge with them. And then the indigenous people were teaching them how to work with that knowledge, you know, for their place. So what they were really getting was a methodology. And then they'd come back and they'd be like, oh yeah, Odin says this, and this is how we figure that out. And yeah, so they'd be like, uh, so, uh, and there are quite a few people recovering that, um, that fin fairing methodology and they're doing really good stuff. But at the same time, they're very worried about a lot of um, white supremacist groups uh, in Germany and Scandinavia who are kind of more reclaiming a bit of a, like a paleo-Nazism <laughs> kind of thing. And, ah, oh, we are cavemen. Yeah, we are the cavemen and we are superior. We have superior strengths, you know. And um, they sort of, I don't know why they're Austrian all of a sudden. There's probably some in Austria too. God damn it. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, there, there, there is a lot of troubling stuff. There's a lot of white activism. And right across the spectrum, you know, from white supremacy to new age sort of, you know, oh, wow, I'm at one with the cosmos. Uh, there's all kinds of fuckery going on there. But, um, but there are people who are doing it the right way. And they cop a lot of flack because people just lump them in the basket with all the other deplorables. But they're like, nah. No, nah, we are doing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of this guy's accent. I've been talking to a Frisian guy from the Netherlands. You know, he's indigenous Frisian from there. And he, he's got some, um, I don't know if you ever saw that Austin Powers movie, like, but that Dutch character, like gold member. <laughs> and he's, hey, have a smoke and a pancake. It's like that. He talks like that. Um, yeah, he's really funny. He's deadly. But I really respect those people, you know, uh, doing that the right way. But then I still talk to the other ones as well. Um, yeah. You got to talk to the Nazis. It's important, and you know, because they, some somebody had to give birth to that person, and they're they're probably mating and making other babies as well. So it's important to connect with them and and you know uh, try and help them find their center again. Um, just a lot of us are getting sick of doing that, I guess. But not me. I still like it. Thanks, I like Jason. talking to the, the Nazis.
I'm actually curious if you could say more about that piece because you talk about that with flat earthers in the book. Just interested. Uh, sorry, which piece? Uh, about talking to Nazis. You talk about talking to flat earthers, listening to flat earthers as well. That's yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, everybody's got good ideas about something. You know, I, I don't know why we have to get so obsessed with our branding about like, no, this is, this is where I'm going. You know, I like, I, I talk to a lot of anti-vaxxers, you know, and I don't really agree with them. Um, but I, I really, I really don't agree with the pro-vaxxers either. Like, I, I think they're both like a bunch of rabid lunatics on either end of that spectrum. And, you know, nobody's actually reading the papers. Everyone's skimming the papers to try to find some factoid that they could chuck in their basket or whatever. And it's just, I mean, just basically science doesn't work like that. You've got to graze over the lot. You've got to see all the data and you've got to keep applying different lenses and you've got to keep testing and retesting and retesting and disproving and disproving and disproving until you end up with a model that vaguely works. You know, that, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And I don't know why people are letting go of all that rigor, um, you know, but they are. Even scientists are letting go of that rigor. And uh, I guess that's part of the calm down thing. It's like, just calm down. But slow down is important too, because, you know, we're making too many changes and fixes and tinkering with everything. Um, everything is operation fucking warp, warp speed at the moment. We've got to operation warp speed everything and just roll it out and see what happens. Um, roll it out right across the board. Like, <laughs> um, you know, but you don't do that. Like you know that in, in, in your garden, if you're trying out a new companion plant or whatever, you know, to get rid of the grasshoppers, you, you put that in a couple of places and you see what happens and you let it go for a couple of seasons. And then you go, ah, yeah, all right. We might bring that one in. You know, that's, that's the way it has to go. You have to slow down if you're playing with systems because there are butterfly effects to things. And, you know, and I guess if you're doing interventions at a massive scale, it's not butterfly effect anymore. That's a goddamn planet effect. That's a whale effect, like cosmic level consequences. Goodness me. Shock waves. Uh, hidden. Hey, what, what, when did I say hidden? Somebody just put up, what do I mean by hidden? I can't remember when I said that. They may be actually discussing another comment in the chat. Uh, all right. Oh, okay. But, Someone else. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that riff. That's really interesting. I want to see if Laura Cleveland wants to ask their question. Looks like she has a good set of questions there. Yeah. Maybe I'll just read them. Um, I just wondered, yeah. What does ontological dialogue look like to an indigenous orientation? Um, what's the place of philosophical conversation? And then how do you differentiate kind of like delusional abstract conceptuality from truly attuned thinking and contemplation? Like, I, I, yeah. think, I think it's all mixed in together, you know? Um, I, think, I think that's it. You know, uh, basically at the core of everything is respect. Um, <clears throat> and you don't separate out things like philosophy. That's just kind of, that's woven in with everything. You know, we don't have a word for that. It's not a separate thing. It's just in everything. And, you know, everybody's in these yarns all the time, you know, so you could have like a senior elder and a knowledge keeper and a song man and, you know, a complete genius, bloody uh, stone napper there. And then a complete madman <laughs> might be there as well. Um, but, you know, it just comes back to that thing. You don't just plant the biggest and brightest seeds. You, you plant the shriveled little withered ones as well. Um, you know, and you, I don't know, you honor and respect your, you know, your people who are, are born like, you know, twisted or deformed or, um, you know, their head's not right or something like that. You know, these are people who it's important to have in the mix. I guess I often use that, um, that example from Africa of that sickle cell anemia, you know, where they're talking about uh, doing gene editing to get rid of that. But the fact is that you, the, 
if you've got uh, sickle cell as a recessive gene, it makes you pretty much malaria proof. You know, so you never know when you get rid of something that you think is no good or what you don't want, you never know what you're throwing out with it. So that's part of, I guess, why I listen to all the uh, damaged people more than anything else. And you damaged people end up like expressing some pretty damaged viewpoints. But usually at the core of somebody, at the core of everybody I've ever met, there's something um, beautiful there. There's their higher self and there's a pattern there um, that has the capacity to make sense of the world in better ways. Um, it's just nobody, you know, it just doesn't get any attention. So it's just buried. Um, but you've got to sit down with them and dig and bring that out. And I guess, you know, even crazy people, it's the best thing about having around. It's a bit like, you know, that little magic eight ball that you get, you ask it a question and shake it and it puts up a random answer. <laughs> if you've got an absolute raving lunatic around the place, just saying random stuff, um, sometimes you get signs from them. They'll, they'll just say something that's just like a, a message out of the sky. You know, it's like shaking that eight ball. There's something random will come out of them that's just the most absolute genius and the thing you really needed to hear. You know, so you got to keep these people around. Even, even the flat earthers, especially the flat earthers. Can you imagine like the amazing lateral thinking that would be needed uh, if you got them all together and with some physicists and mathematicians and, and they all sat down and tried to make the maths work for flat earth? Like just the kind of thinking that would come out from that, they'd, they'd never be able to do it but just the effort of trying to make the maths work. You know, I reckon they discover some interesting stuff there. Come out, it wouldn't be the earth is flat, but it, it might just be, you know, oh my God, we've figured out fusion. Um, all right, we figured out how to turn lithium into dilithium. And now it's Star Trek time. You know, you never know what, what would come out of that. Maybe, I don't know. If I could just ask a follow-up question, I like I would um, like what would you make of a conversation about like um, the status or the activity of reality? You know, like the way, <laughs> the, like the fundamental principles of um, the way things work. Is that is that is it is it image like in mythology, or is there is there a place for it kind of separate? Um, well, you, you need good story. Uh, for reality to work right, um, you need good story. That doesn't mean, you know, factually true story, um, but you know, you, you just need good story, uh, you know, to base your worldview on, to, to hold and carry all your methodologies and ontologies and um, everything else that shows you the good patterns of things. Um, you know, like everybody, most scholars accept that the first 500 years of Rome's history is complete bullshit and made up. Um, but it was good story for the pattern that they wanted to do. You know, they, they had good story to justify doing the things that they wanted to do. Nice. Thanks, Tyson. Um, hey, sorry. Like Oh, no worries. Um, looks like we're sort of at the end here. Maybe uh, I saw an interesting question from Carl Hsu, if you want to ask your question <clears throat> and get, a, get ask that I last question. I still got question. time. I just uh, oh, cool. wanted something. Oh, gotcha. Cool. Yeah, I just need to scroll up. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge and kind of that indigenous viewpoint that, you know, it's just... I guess it's pretty foreign for somebody who grew up in a culture where the indigenous uh, viewpoint isn't isn't something that's in common mind. Um, I can't find that question though. Uh, it was about urban uh, landscapes, living in urban. Yeah, um, yeah, it was kind of a tack on to uh, Coletti's um, question of, uh, is there a possibility of balance and harmony in an urbanized setting? Um, with the environment, because I, I mean, I hear when you speak of the environment, it feels more uh, natural, 
I suppose. Mm. But again, in certain contexts, you can consider, you know, living and growing up in an urban environment natural for an urban creature. So, yeah, how would you yeah. find that balance and harmony? Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think it is natural for an urban creature. You know, urban creatures get sick and they tend to want to kill themselves a lot. You know, and I think if you're, <laughs> that's not a sign that you're doing well or <laughs> you're in a habitat that you're supposed to be in. Um, look, this is something I struggle with, you know, because a lot of my old people and knowledge keepers tell me that everything is part of creation, that everything has dreaming and that there's no valid way to separate between natural and synthetic, you know, and um, so I should, you know, just not be too worried about it, not too up upset about it or anything like that. And I'm saying, well, but I am angry about it and I do hate it. And um, my hate is also part of creation. <laughs> then uh, if you're under your hypothesis there, so um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on hating those things. So I don't know, you ask me, I don't have the answers, uh, but I do struggle with them a lot, uh, the questions. And, you know, I, I, I end up sort of seesawing wildly back and forth. But I, I did sort of, I don't know, I have arrived at a place where I think, um, yes, everything is natural, everything's part of creation, and you can't separate natural and synthetic. However, there is, there is a law of the land sort of anything that you do where nature will smack, you know, where the outcome will kill you and, um, and damage everybody and everything is, you know, that's, that's the land punishing you and you probably shouldn't do it. And usually what this is about is combining things that shouldn't be combined. You know, there are substances that shouldn't be put together because they give off poisonous fumes or they create radiation or, you know, whatever there's, um, you know, there's, there's people who should not mate together. There's like, you know, if you've got a species that starts parent and child matings and just ends up doing that all the time, that species isn't going to last long. You know, nature has an answer for that. That's against the law of the land. So you're going to end up with so many mutations and birth defects that that thing just, that whole species will just collapse. So, you know, it's, it's about wrong combination. You know, there's things that shouldn't go together. And, um, and yes, those things are part of creation, but also, eh, you know, um, probably should stop doing that anyway. And I think your urban environment is just, it's just a wrong place, you know, a wrong way of being. And, and I think most human beings know that and understand that and would get out of it if they could. Um, I can't at the moment, I won't be able to get out of it for another three years. And so, but I need to somehow come into balance enough to survive that three years you know um you know so and i guess if i ever come up with an answer to how i'm going to do that then i'll let you know um but i talked to lots of different people um you know i'm not into veganism but i was talking to a vegan who gave me a potential answer and you know because i hate doing exercise and he was talking about well you know you maybe you'll find those song lines under the concrete and go and run those song lines and so your exercise will be ritual, will be ceremony. And I'm like, ah, oh, genius. I didn't do it yet, but I might. <laughs> so it's good to talk to everybody. So what did we do? We did, um, just wrapping up, we did, we did slow down, calm down, scale down, and step down. I think we covered most of them. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyson, for coming. I'm really excited to see, watch as you figure out how to achieve balance in the urban setting. So uh, yeah. with that, I'd like to pass it to Peter. Cool. Thank you, Campbell, for emceeing today. Uh, and thank you, Tyson, for coming to STOA. I might have to keep it around for a couple more months if you decide to come back. So just, just for the record. Yeah. Um, well, I just, just drop us a line. I'll come to the next thing. Cool. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll make the next thing and it'll be, it'll be good for a while too. And um, the immediateness thing tomorrow, we have an unsuccess symposium, a uh, full day event. You can check out the website for that. And then after that, we got polymory and versus monogamy, a discussion with Janet Benant.
Um, that's at uh, December 23rd, 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and maybe Gray will be emceeing that. So that being said, uh, Tyson Campbell, everyone, thanks for coming to Stoa.